Hey, what's up, worship and ministry leaders? Thanks for following this page, Confessions of a Worship Leader. My name is Brandon Dempsey of worshipteamtraining.com and the author of this site and coming book. Yes, I'm coming to you also from my car here. So, never done this before. So, if you're not distracted, I'm not either. All right. So, anyway, about this page, welcome. And if you are, were in a place where you've been damaged or discouraged by ministry, then this site, this page, is just for you. Confessions of a Worship Leader is born out of my story of crazy and heartbreaking church ministry experiences and to share them and other candid topics with you to help you in your walk as a worship or ministry leader. So, I've had this running story uh, for a few years back about after the worship service. And, you know, after the worship service is really about how you dealt with uh, worship when you look back on um, walking away from the stage and you know that maybe there are some things that weren't quite the way that you wanted it to go. Um, you could have had something happen in terms of uh, maybe somebody said something to you. Uh, maybe you thought things were fine and you did the worship service and then all of a sudden, boom, somebody hits you with this question. Um, I've had that happen many times before, and you have too. So, to go back in time, I was leading at one of my first churches of leading worship as a full-time worship leader. And I thought everything was cool. I thought it was a great service. And then, lo and behold, um, I have the question from one of the elders' wives that came to me and said, Why did you do that? Why did you do that song? I, I thought, okay, well, um, I'm trying to think back about, well, what song was it? And I had asked her, and she reminded me that it was like the second or third tune, whatever. And I said, okay, well, now mind you, she's also on the worship team, okay? But she just ha not happened to be on rotation that weekend. So... She's quizzed me about the song. I agreed that, you know, it was done, and uh, but I admitted that, yeah, I liked the song, and that's why I picked it. And then she started to remind me about past rehearsals and how not everybody else liked it. And then she went on to say that maybe the, she didn't think that the congregation liked it. Um, in fact, she was looking around the room, and she didn't see anybody worshiping, and she didn't think that... For sure, she was convinced people did not like the song, and therefore, the church didn't worship because it was my fault for picking the song, okay? So, you know, I had to think through that, process it very quickly, because she wanted an answer, and she really wanted to know what was my thinking and why did I choose that song. And I had to really be careful with my words because she is the elder's wife and whatever comes from her mouth to her husband to maybe reaching to the pastor could be bad news for me, right? You've been in that position. So I just had to agree with her that, you know what? I under I said to her, I understand why you don't like that song. And, and in fact, she gave me her reasons of why she didn't like it. And I had agreed that it was a problem for her. And so I just simply, and let me just ask you, what do you do in situations like that? You know, uh, do you identify with them on the balance of validating where they're at? Or do you just get mad and walk off? Or do you say something that maybe you would regret? Like, well, that's the way I'm choosing it. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. You know, I think uh, there definitely is a, an art to handling it. And we all figure that out week by week. It's not a one and done thing. For me, during that time, I had to look at it and just, I, I remember scripture saying, you know, um, I'm paraphrasing, but agree uh, with your enemy, so to speak. So I had to agree with her. I think the scripture verse comes to mind that a soft answer turns away wrath. So I knew very quickly because she was very, um, you know, confrontational about it 
I thought, well, I need to choose my words wisely and just be soft in my approach and in my answer. While I'm forming the words, then I'm realizing very quickly, oh, she's not on rotation. And she began to tell me why that song meant a lot to her because that was the song she wanted to lead. And the fact that I didn't choose, the fact that I chose it without her singing it on that weekend, that was the trouble. So very quickly, I just identified that and, and I listened to her. I said, yeah, you know, I'm just going to use her name, Beth. It, just a, that's not her real name, but just to protect the guilty. Uh, Beth, you're exactly right. Um, I understand why that song meant a lot to you because you actually sang it in rehearsal. And I remember you wanting to sing it on a Sunday. Is that right? And she was like, well, yeah, I, I did. I, and I, you picked the song that I wasn't on rotation. Why did you do that? And I had to gently put it to her saying, you know what? And I don't know what came over me, God himself. And I just said, you know, Beth, you have a great voice. And I would love to have you sing that song any time on a weekend. But it just so happened to be that the way that song was fitting into the message, you know, I wish that we could have moved things around, but I had two other singers that were already on hold and that needed to sing that weekend, this past weekend. So to have, to change up that schedule, it probably would have upset them. And so the song was in no disrespect to you, actually, uh, you picked that song before, and it's a great message. So how do we honor God with that message? You know, and how, how do we put it in a light where us as a team come together and we do what's best for the message of the song, not so much the one who may be leading it? And then she thought about that, and I can see she slowly came down. She's like, well, yeah, you're right. It's not about me, Brandon. Um... I do want to sing that song. I'm sorry I came at you. And then, and then just to kind of help, you know, turn things around in, in a nice way, I just said, well, can we do the song on another weekend and have you lead it for sure? She said yes. Now, walking away from that, um, you know, I doubt it myself. I, I thought, well, well, gee, maybe, maybe she's right. Maybe, uh, I'm not the, the, the greatest uh, of the ministry here. And maybe as a worship leader, I failed and did my job and I, I should have asked her and I didn't. Uh, maybe I should have told those other people no. Um, maybe their feelings didn't matter and I could have had her because after all, she is the, pa uh, the elder's wife. <laughs> Pastor's wife, wow, that's another, that's another story for later, okay? But in this moment, I was doubting myself. So I want to ask you, you know, like, after the worship service, how do you deal with doubt? If something was said to you or not? I find that we are our own self-critics, right? And if it's not someone judging us, it's the old messages we hear saying, well, why did you do this worship song? And why did you sing or play that? Uh, why did you miss that chord? Why didn't you come in on time, right? This could be said by your worship team too. Oh, the, or the last statement, as you may be saying, saying to yourself, I'm never good enough. Maybe you heard somebody say that about you. Maybe that's been a fear of, of yours for years and years. The truth is this. If you had a mustard seed of faith in the working, then God was with you in the doing. That's right. You led the worship that morning, whether it was this past Sunday or a month ago or, or a year ago, maybe. It's still eating at you. But you led the worship the way that he wanted you to, not the way of your critics. Your critics are not Jesus in a crowd. We worship Jesus as the crowd. Simply, you are good enough. And this is why God put you there. So, as a worship leader, how do you also deal with failure? That's another big topic. We have doubt, we have failure. He has given you God has given you a, a God-sized assignment. And the old tapes in your head reminds you that you can't do it on your own. You know, this is the same thing, the same doubtful statements that we said earlier. Now you have these new statements about failure. 
plan in your head. Well, if God doesn't help me, I will fail. That right there is the pressure point where many leaders, many worship leaders decide not to follow what they hear God calling them to do because of fear of failure. The truth is, courage and confidence always follows obedience. And this is why failure is part of the success. This is why doubt is also a caveat to the spiritual victory. Because I believe, I don't believe that God sends us times of doubt and failure. I believe that they happen because we live in a fallen world, and I believe that God allows us to go through it for us to work it out in our faith with God's help, and in which God is longing and waiting for us to ask for his help when it comes to failure and doubt. And I believe that in those times, God speaks. And it's almost like he's saying, hey, but are you going to come to me for help? Don't, don't be sitting in your self-pity. I'm at the door knocking. Are you coming to me? I want, I want to help you. And many times we fail at that because, again, fear of failure. We think, well, what is, right? Well, what does God think of me? If I think of me about this way, what about God? Well, do you really know that the Lord is that way of the Bible? I mean, read your Bible. Have you ever seen God be that way? No. What you've seen are the lies of the enemy that tell you that. What you hear are the words of doubt and the fears of failure coming from the enemy, not coming from the Lord of the Bible, the God, God and his word. So we need to be very clear and very sharp and to decipher what words we're hearing, what messages that we're playing in our mind. I talked about this last week in the previous video about the negative voices around us. Well, this is very much the same thing. They are negative voices. How we deal, here's a, here's a kicker that I've learned, I'm still learning, how we deal with the doubt, how we deal with the failure speaks of the success and victory that God already has for us. It's not a question if we're going to gain victory. It's the reality of we will gain the victory. But how are we to learn from God through it? What is God shaping and making us to be on the inside? Because it's so easy for us to say, well, God, just take this failure, this, uh, this seed of fear away from me. Well, sure, he can do that. Absolutely. But, you know, you see this through Paul and his excursions and, and, and missions throughout the churches. He pleaded, right, with God to take that thorn away from the side of from his side. We don't know what that thorn was, but we are rest assured that it was something that was uncomfortable, that was nagging, that was giving him pressure and pain and fear and torment. So even Paul said, not my will, but thy will be done. Paul said, but this is from my learning. Paul says in other places that I buffet my body, I beat my breast, knowing that God is at work within me. He's engineering all my circumstances for good. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. And in that situation for me with my own worship team member, that's right, it's funny to think that, but it's a reality and it happens. And even in that moment, I had to seek God first and, and, and pray and just ask God, what are you wanting me to learn from this? How am I to li help me listen to what's being said? Help me not take it personal and help me understand how I can help this person. Because see, if you make it more about them, it becomes less about you. I mean, you start fumbling for answers about what you've done and you start, you start giving in then to that doubt and fear of that failure. But if you put it back on them, like, okay, well, hey, tell me more. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry that you felt that way. You make it more about them, then it deflects all the arrows from you. It's pretty beautiful. And it also helps us in a spiritual standpoint too, because it's like not sitting in the corner in our own muck going, woe is me, God, rather than make it about God, right? It works the same way. So, None of this is perfect, the way that we try to work through difficulty of failure and doubt. But I will say to you that these are some things that have helped me, and I also forget too. 
Uh, but I ask you, what are some what are some things that you've learned along the way that have helped you develop in dealing with failure, doubt, and fear? Hit me up, PM me. Uh, you can find me at on Twitter or Instagram at Brandon Dempsey, B R A N O N D E M P S E Y. And also be sure to uh, check out other things that we got going on, our podcasts and so forth at worshipteentraining.com. And plus, don't forget the Confessions of a Worship Leader sec- episode podcast that I've been uploading to these social sites as well. So anyway, got to go for now. I love you. And um, I hope that this is some help to you. And I look forward to our next conversation together. So see you soon. Love you. Bye.